All right, so on the previous slide, we talked about, we stopped with lysosomes. So lysosomes digest things. And I wanted to mention, because uh, I don't think I mentioned it before, that technically you might think we don't need lysosomes in our cells because we actually have a digestive system. So by the time amino acids and carbohydrates and all of those things get to our cells, they've already been digested. But remember that lysosomes can also eat worn out cell parts. If we go back here for a second. Um, so autophagy, where the cell's actual cell parts can get recycled. And then there's phagocytosis, like your white blood cells, where they eat bacteria and viruses and things that don't belong in your body. And it's also possible that your cell builds something and then needs to break it down for some reason. So although we technically digest our food in our digestive tract, um, single-celled organisms would need to digest all of their food using the lysosomes, because that would be their only digestive system. Uh, but our lysosomes do still have jobs. Okay, vacuoles look a lot like lysosomes. They're little sacs. Um, and depending on the type of vacuole, they actually can have different functions. So in animal cells, the vacuoles that we would see, they might store things, um, and they might also be food vacuoles, meaning when a cell eats something by phagocytosis, so here's my cell, it's eating something, now this would be a food vacuole inside of this little membrane where the cell ate this thing. Um, and that food vacuole then might go to the lysosomes, for example, for digestion. So that would be one type of vacuole. Plants have what's called a central vacuole. Now this is the only vacuole type that I would ask you to label on our test that we're going to take. That would be fair game because unlike other vacuoles that are just little circles that look like a vesicle or look like a lysosome, a vacuole, a central vacuole in a plant is big like this. This would be the vacuole in the plant. And although we probably, you probably couldn't see it when we looked at the elodia, you could see the evidence of it. Because technically, when you looked at the elodia leaf, hopefully, you saw all these chloroplasts. You might have even seen them moving around, like around the cell. And what you didn't really probably notice is the fact that they were pushed up against the cell membrane. What was doing the pushing? The vacuole. The vacuole in a plant is full of water, and it fills up so much with water that this is what makes the leaves turgid or stiff. If you don't water your plants and they start to look wilted, it's literally because of the vacuole. The vacuole that's normally creating all this pressure on the cell membrane and forcing it against the cell wall and making each cell stiff, therefore making the stem and the leaf and all the plant parts stiff, the plant will start to wilt because that vacuole will lose its water. And so basically the vacuole shrivels up, the cell membrane eventually can, in a, in a really uh, severe situation, can even pull away, and the cell walls sort of collapse a bit, and they don't look as stiff anymore. So central vacuole is something that I could ask you to label on a test. The third kind of vacuole, and I wouldn't ask you to, to label this uh, for now, but we'll come back to that in the next chapter, is called a contractile vacuole. Freshwater protists, meaning uh, those little single-celled eukaryotic organisms that live in ponds, one of the issues that they face is that they're living in fresh water, and water tends to go from higher concentrations to lower concentrations by osmosis, so they tend to gain water all the time. They tend to swell up. Well, one of the things that would prevent them from exploding is the contractile vacuole. It literally fills up with water and squirts out all the extra water. I have a diagram of this here on this next slide. So in the top left, you can see a, what a central vacuole looks like in a plant cell. Uh, this is under a, an electron microscope. You see how big it is. And then in the bottom left there, that's a contractile vacuole. It looks kind of like a flower almost. It swells up whenever the cell absorbs water from its surroundings, and it literally squirts that water back out again. And you can also see it on the right in the bottom. You can see um, here a vacuole full of water, and now after it's squirted out the extra water. And here again is the central vacuole in a plant. Again, that's the only one that I would ask you to label on a test. In fact, it's one of the ways you would know that the cell you're looking at is a plant cell. The cell wall, that central vacuole being really big, and then chloroplasts, which I'm going to talk about next. Okay, um, so that is vacuoles. Um, so we're going to talk now about the chloroplasts and the mitochondria, which are energy. They're both related to energy in a cell. So... First, mitochondria. So mitochondria are the sites of what we call cell respiration, which is a different chapter that we're going to talk about. But in essence, what happens in the mitochondria is that they use oxygen and sugar, and they generate ATP, which is basically your cell source of energy. 
all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. There's a misconception that animals have mitochondria and plants have chloroplasts. That is a misconception. Mitochondria are found in both because both plants and animal and fungi cells, we all need energy. And so mitochondria are typically found in almost all eukaryotic cells. And that's why cells need oxygen, because the oxygen is used by the mitochondria um, in the process of cell respiration. Chloroplasts look different than mitochondria. They are the ones that are found only in plants and some algae, and they are the sites of photosynthesis. What happens in photosynthesis is the energy from sunlight is captured into sugar. So energy from the sun gets captured in the bonds of sugar, and then in the mitochondria, as that, su that sugar is actually broken down into carbon dioxide and water, and that's used to generate ATP. So there is this relationship between the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. Plants basically have the sugar that they need already, whereas animals have to eat their sugar. But again, both plants and animals have mitochondria, only the plants have chloroplasts. Now, in a picture of a cell, as far as recognizing them, a mitochondria in a two-dimensional picture would look like this. That's your mitochondria. Chloroplasts, they usually draw like this with these little stacks inside of them. Um, so that's the difference in what they would look like in a two-dimensional picture, like what you might see on a test. At the bottom here, we have a, mito um, a chloroplast, um, and at the top, they're a mitochondria three-dimensionally, but the picture you would see on a test, again, would be two-dimensional. So the mitochondria looks kind of like a bean shape with this squiggly inside. Chloroplasts a little fatter, and it has these stacks inside, which are what these stacks are. And then there is one other one. Uh, that's energy related and it's called a peroxisome. Peroxisomes you would not have to identify in a picture, but you should know what they are. Um, the most important thing that uh, peroxisomes do is they break fatty acids down and they basically feed the fatty acid products into the mitochondria. So when you resort to fat as your, um, as your energy source, you know, maybe because you're on a low carb diet and you're trying to lose weight, your peroxisomes are the ones that are breaking the fat down. And I believe the next slide actually talks a little bit more about peroxisomes. So let me go ahead and go there. So a little more about peroxisomes. So they are metabolic, meaning they have to do with energy. Their most important job is that they break down fatty acids and feed them to the mitochondria. So your mitochondria don't just use sugar, but your mitochondria can also use fat for energy. Um, they are important in myelin. Myelin is, is something that's involved in your nervous system, or actually you won't be tested on that function of them. Um, and they also break down alcohol. So although the, the smooth ER is the real um, organelle that has the job of breaking down uh, drugs, I mentioned, um, but specifically alcohol can be broken down by peroxisomes. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have peroxisomes specifically just because of when you drink alcohol. Um, you know, peroxisomes have other jobs. Ethanol can be a byproduct of different things. Um, and the, the name peroxisome comes from the fact that the waste product they make is actually peroxide, the same stuff you put on cuts. And they have an enzyme that converts that peroxide into water, which is why if you put peroxide on a cut, it bubbles. You're actually not killing anything. Um, what you're actually doing is, since you have a cut there, you have peroxisomes in your cells where that cut is, and the peroxisomes are literally breaking the peroxide into water and oxygen. And the bubbles you see are oxygen bubbles. They do use peroxide um, in a doctor's office not to sterilize a cut, but if you were, for example, if you uh, had a, a lot of dirt, like you were in an accident and there's a lot of dirt and dead cells and, or pus or whatever, they'll put peroxide on a cut to bubble that stuff out because it'll foam and bubble and it'll bubble stuff out. But it actually doesn't kill the bacteria. It just sort of cleans out everything that's sort of stuck in there, and then you can put an antibiotic or something on there. Anyway, so that's peroxisomes. Now, um, something really important about the, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts is what's called the endosymbiotic theory. So the endosymbiotic theory is basically a model for how mitochondria and chloroplasts became part of the cell. And it's really important that you know this. So this is basically what they think. They think that you had a prokaryotic cell, a bacteria-like cell, a larger one, maybe a more complex one, and it basically ate a smaller prokaryotic cell, sort of like your white blood cells would eat a bacteria. But rather than that cell getting digested, it actually lived inside of the other cell. 
and they basically had what we call a symbiotic relationship. In other words, they helped each other out because it turned out that this cell that the prokaryotic uh, cell ate could use oxygen and make ATP. Well, that's beneficial to this cell because this other prokaryotic cell needs energy and it did not have the ability to use oxygen to make ATP. Um, and then this other cell benefits, the one that got eaten, because it basically has a place to live. Over time, these were no longer separate organisms. This cell that got eaten became part of the larger cell. So that's basically what, pro, what uh, endosomatic theory says, um, that the way that mitochondria were created was that a prokaryotic cell basically ate another cell. Instead of digesting it, the cell lived inside of it. And over time, they developed this relationship to where eventually that smaller cell just became part of it. And so, um, and then chloroplasts, this happened a second time with a cell that was able to use sunlight to, um, to gain its energy. Um, and that's how chloroplasts came about. Now, so here's uh, sort of a diagram of, of what happened. It's a little blurry. But basically what they're saying is this cell ate this bacteria. Eventually the bacteria became mitochondria. It, it uh, became part of the cell. And then the cell ate another bacteria. It happened to eat one that was photosynthetic, that could actually um, use the sun's, ener sun's energy and produce sugar, and that became part of the cell too. And that's why plant cells have both mitochondria and chloroplasts, because they came from a cell that had already gotten mitochondria, but now additionally got chloroplasts, and then animal cells um, only have mitochondria, because um, that came from an ancestral cell that ate the mitochondria or ate the bacteria that became mitochondria but did not eat the cell that became chloroplasts. So that's sort of the idea. Now, this may seem a little far-fetched. So what's the evidence? Why do they think this is what happened? Well, here is the evidence for endosymbiotic theory, and this is what, what you do need to know. First, mitochondria and chloroplasts have a double membrane. Why is that significant? Because when a cell eats something, this is what it does. A piece of the cell membrane breaks off and ends up surrounding the thing it eats. So by having a double membrane, it would support, that would be evidence that a cell ate another cell. Not only do they have a double membrane, but their inner membrane is very much like bacterial membranes. The outer membrane is very much like the cell membrane of a eukaryotic cell. This is exactly what you would expect if a cell ate another cell. A double membrane with the outer one made of cell membrane and the inner one more similar to a bacteria because that's what was eaten. It would have been the original membrane of the, of the actual mitochondria and chloroplasts. Secondly, if they lived on their own, they would have had to have had their own DNA. They do. They have their own DNA. They have their own ribosomes, just like a bacteria. Not only do they have their own DNA, but their bacterial, their ribosomes and their DNA are like bacterial ribosomes and DNA of today, which are different than eukaryotic DNA and ribosomes of today. There's a difference in how they look. So the fact that mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA would be further evidence that they were a cell that was living on its own and it got eaten at some point. And finally, the third piece of evidence is that they actually reproduce and grow independently. Now, I don't mean independently outside the cell. A bacteria, a, um, a mitochondria, and a chloroplast cannot survive on their own. But what I'm saying is, when the cell divides and the nucleus controls all of that, the nucleus does not control the division of the mitochondria and the chloroplast. They basically make their own decisions. So since mitochondria and chloroplast divide on their own when they decide to, not under the control of the nucleus, this would be further evidence that they might be their own thing, or at least that they used to be their own thing, that they could have at one point in evolution lived independently. So please be aware of these pieces of evidence uh, because you will uh, be asked questions about it, and you could also be asked questions about it on the AP exam. So that's the evidence that supports the endosymbiotic theory.